What I want to do today is just really take you through um, what the Raspberry Pi is, what you can use it for. Little aside, which I've found quite interesting in terms of a, a valid use for these devices involving talking to the hardware. Quick plug for my Raspberry Pi arcade table, which is nearly working after two years. And then any questions and, and, and whatnot that you've got towards the end. Does that sound about sensible? Everyone happy with that? Good, because I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> Why would I care? Okay, so, quick word. Well, this is an old one now. This is an old school Raspberry Pi. This is a Model B. Uh, there's now a Model B+. Plus. Uh, basically, I think a few years ago they thought, what would happen if we took the processor from a mobile phone and a, a, a quite powerful graphics chip and some nice I.O. and slapped it on a device and sold it as a computer and they weren't quite sure what would happen so they did anyway um, and the Pi was the result. Um, the first one, if you can remember far enough back, you had to have it on a USB dongle that you would plug into your PC uh, and uh, it will give you a, a computer plug into your computer. Um, it got a bit bigger than that and so now it's kind of credit card size. It has around the same kind of computing power as a modern smartphone. That's probably a bit out of date in that now smartphones are quite a lot more powerful than the Pi. Um, but uh, it's, it's properly powerful and good enough to be useful. It runs a version of, a, of the Linux called, called Debian, although there's lots and lots of different versions you can get for the Pi. Uh, and the OS lives on an SD card, uh, which you plug in the back. The new Pi, the, 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 the Plus model, has a micro SD card which works in the same way um, so it boots off the SD card and the SD card provides the mass storage um, they have 256 or 512k uh, of memory and uh, meg of memory? no, meg? yeah, yeah meg, I prefer meg, meg sounds better um, um, is it meg? I can't remember anyway, um, they have a reasonable amount of memory uh, and a whole bunch of KO pins, which are the bits that make it interesting for me. Um, to get started, you could buy one of these for about 25 quid. That's just the Pi processor on its own. You need an SD card with the image of the particular version of Unix you want to run on, on it. Uh, you can buy these preloaded, or you can actually roll your own. There are programs that you can use to let you download the big image and then burn it onto an SD card, easy enough. Um, to get input and output, uh, USB keyboard and mouse can go in there and then you can plug an HDMI monitor into there and one of the things about the Pi which is rather pleasing is that the HDMI video output quality is really really good it's extremely good at displaying video and so for things like media center applications the Pi is, is a really nice device to go for um, but the bottom bullet point the Raspberry Pi can be very picky about USB devices you plug into it. Um, the new ones are supposed to be better, but I'm not completely convinced myself. Some USB keyboards uh, don't work with the Pi. Um, some USB mice, similar thing. You can have issues where keys appear to get stuck down or auto-repeat or do all kinds of daftness. Um, and so your best way is to try and find one that you know works. So you go onto Amazon and places and they actually... You can use the powered USB hub. Well. You can. Um, the other issue is that the power output from this thing is not great. Uh, the powered USB hub doesn't always fix the issues with the keyboards and things though. Okay. I've had people that have actually bought hubs and plugged them in and the keyboard still doesn't go. Um, if you go on to Amazon or one of these providers and take a look at stuff that's got reviews that say it works with Pi and buy those, that would be my advice. Uh, that's how I've got all my stuff. It's one of these weird things where sometimes the older the stuff is, the better it works. I've got some really old keyboards that I've got that work fine with the Pi, and the newer ones don't work so well. But um, the bottom line is suck it and see. One of the problems with the Pi is that the, the, the B, original B, had just two USB ports, which meant that the mouse goes in there, and the keyboard goes in there, and the Wi Fi adapter goes, well, it doesn't go at all, so you have to mess around with that. Um, but um, the new one's got four, which means you can plug in a whole bunch of things, and the need for a hub is much reduced. Uh, which is kind of nice. They've just released, there's a Model A version of the Pi as well, which has got uh, no network connection, and it's designed to be cheaper to make and also lower power, so you can actually put it in robots and other embedded things that can run around. Uh, there's just been released the A+, which is again, smaller and cheaper. 
The Plus versions have more pins that you can control from software, which is nice. And they are supposed to have a better power supply on them. Although better, in my experience, means when you plug the keyboard in, it resets, which is not quite so good. Um, I've had to sort of fiddle it out a bit. Um, but uh, they're all much of a muchness, and they all work very well. Um, like it says here, the A Pi is cheaper and doesn't have any inputs and outputs. The B is the one you really want, and the B Plus has more USB and a better power supply, probably. Um, in truth, uh, for the kind of things you want to do, any old Pi will do. If you get the chance to pick up a, an old B cheap, then it's not a bad buy. Um, a lot of the stuff that's out there just works with it. Uh, and, and so, yeah, think in terms of doing that if you want to have a play with this. What you can plug it into is pretty much everything. Um, USB devices, of course, hubs, printers, network connections. Uh, one trick you can play, which works really well, for about six quid or seven pounds, you can buy a tiny Wi Fi adapter to go in here and make it Wi Fi enabled. Um, and then you can do what's called remote desktoping, where I don't have a keyboard and a screen put into this thing. And I just go across the network and actually use it remotely from my PC. That makes it really pleasant to work in. Um, one of the things you find if you use the Pi as a computer with a keyboard and a mouse is yes, you can run a Windows environment. Yes, you can run a word processor. Yes, you can write Python programs using Idle. No, you won't enjoy it because it's a bit slow. Uh, as soon as you start something happening on the Pi, there's a little progress indicator at the bottom of the screen, and that basically goes bang and maxes out in terms of processing power. So opening up Windows and, and doing stuff of a reasonable amount of, of effort required will tax this poor little processor in here a bit more than it should. And so if you're used to a reasonable PC experience, the Pi is a tad on the slow side. Having said that, it's absolutely fine for um, embedded stuff. Um, and um, I particularly like it in this role because the fact it's got Wi-Fi on it and you can run it from a standard mobile phone power adapter, which goes in the micro USB slot on the front, means that you can basically put this anywhere and it'll be useful. If I wanted a device to tell me when my washing machine is broken and is about to flood the kitchen, well then I could very easily slap one of these underneath the uh, kitchen cabinet with a couple of wires off here to a moisture sensor, and I could make it tweet me or send me an email or whatever you like when that kind of thing happens. And to do that, it would cost me about 25, 30 pounds in parts, tops. And for that, for that kind of price, you're getting an awful lot of, of useful stuff. As a connected device, this is really good. There's also uh, a camera been released for it, which plugs into these connectors here, which is actually pretty high quality. It costs around 20 quid. There's two versions, one that works with visible light and one that works with infrared. And so if you want to do anything like have a thing which pings you a picture when it sees somebody go past the sensor or whatnot, that kind of stuff with the Pi is really, really easy to make. So you can, you can knock out simple connected apps. Um, I did a session about the Arduino a few, few weeks back. The Arduino is great for small embedded control stuff. Where it starts to lose the plot a bit is looking at connected type stuff. But um, I've got this plan for... <laughs> um, I'm building a thing to go in the hall at home, which will replace a clock that's in there. And I'm going to give the home its own Gmail address and, and, and Gmail. So I can basically send the house emails and it will then display them in the hall for anyone that walks past. And I can also have the house detect events and send me emails going the other way. And it'll all be done by a Raspberry Pi hanging on the wall in a little perspex case with a text display on top of it. And it'll cost me yeah, <laughs> a few quid, but less than a clock, maybe. Um, and, and the idea is that but the thing about these things is you can knock out simple connected appliances really easily. Uh, and uh, you can tie them to all kinds of external peripherals. Got a big hard drive, plug it on here. One good use for a Pi is if you've got a whole ton of uh, media which you want to watch, plug the drive in and just watch it, or put the drive onto a network store somewhere and watch it via the network connection on the Pi. It's very, very good for that. Um, have you guys heard of XBMC? Xbox Media Center? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very old Microsoft standard that's been out there for absolutely years and lets you actually watch stuff on your Xbox. But if you haven't got an original Xbox, you can get a SD card like this for your Pi, which makes it into a media hub. So you put your SD card in here, you plug your 
pie in the back of your big telly and you now have a device that's pretty much as good as Apple TV only better because it's open and it'll play all kinds of stuff so that's a good line to go for in fact I think I have a slide about that in other tracks in terms of what we plug in the back this is the SD card that's not to scale they're a little bit smaller than that when you actually use them ha ha um, and, and so you load it up with Linux or whatever you like I mean the great thing about this um, and I've done this as well does it say so yeah um, if, if you if you nuke if you totally blow away your operating system because you've done something stupid uh, my favourite trick is uh, it must be secure so I'll put a proper password on and then promptly forget it so now I have an SD card which is kind of like uh, I've ripped the pie sort of so I have to re-blow the OS onto it and start it again from default um, but you can get these or you can make your own either works quite well um, if you want to get hold of the operating system it's called Raspbian and it lives on the down it's about uh, two or three gigabytes uh, and you download that and a small program that lets you burn the SD cards and then off you go uh, and yeah it works very well I, I don't mind Linux it, it's it's okay um, you get and you end up it's not like Windows though and you turn the power on and you get this huge amount of rattleage uh, which is stuff your Pi is doing as it boots Windows does just the same thing your mobile phone does just the same thing but you don't normally see it it's normally hidden from you, it's hidden from view. When your Android phone boots up, it does something very similar to this, but you don't actually see all this text whiz past uh, because that's kind of hidden from you. It gets into the Windows environment, fires that up, and then away you go. Uh, you can do everything from the command line if you like. Um, Linux skills are very marketable. They're a great thing to have on your CV. If you know how to find your way around a Linux machine, uh, connect drives, run programs, edit text files, uh, change permissions on files and do that stuff this is a useful thing to be able to boast about at interviews so it's worth spending some time uh, you can get some, some uh, online guides and bits and bobs just learning how to set things up and make things happen on a, on a Unix, Unix environment is a good thing to do and so from that point of view it's worth spending some time with it um, Windows, yeah you can do that too we have a thing called X Windows which is uh, uh, a bit like Microsoft Windows uh, you can run browsers, uh, there are programs, uh, uh, free versions of Office compatible stuff which you can actually run on there as well. But yeah, the bottom bullet point on this thing is really, really, really important. You're using a smartphone to do this. And you've given the smartphone a great big display to look after with um, uh, icons and pointers and all that kind of good stuff. And if you start doing anything particularly heavyweight, then you find that uh, the, the little indicator up here uh, will actually flatten up to, to full power and uh, yes, uh, it will slow down. You don't get a great experience. But it's not about that. The way I put the Pi as I see it is not about actually using it as a PC replacement. Um, used to so people would buy a Raspberry Pi and they'd go home and they'd unplug their monitor and keyboard from their proper computer and plug it in their Pi and try and use it, uh, which is an interesting way to go along. What I do is I make the thing headless as fast as I can, get my Wi-Fi adapter in there, put it in the device I'm controlling, and then off I go. So I never really plug things into the monitor and the, and the keyboard, really, because it's not a great experience. It's a bit on the slow side. One thing, you can run Minecraft on this, though. I haven't done that. The Minecraft on the Pi is actually quite nice because, A, it's free, which is nice, and, B, you can write programs in Python that control the Minecraft universe. So you can actually make Python programs design and build things for you in a Minecraft world and that's hilarious you can build walls and buildings and stuff using Python subroutines that, that's quite amusing to do uh, or maybe that's just me I don't know either way um, things worth knowing yeah you can move the SD card around but if you plug an SD card from a B into a B plus it probably won't boot because the newer ones are they have subtle hardware differences that the old OS doesn't like um, like I said, if you completely break it, just copy a new one on top, it'll be fine. If you use the Pi on a LAN, on a network, you can get tons and tons of free stuff and do some really useful updating and whatnot via the network connection. There are some commands you can use to actually get stuff uh, and, and uh, install things. It's very, very easy to pick things up and use them on this. Wi-Fi apps, yeah, around a tenner is probably a bit on the top side, actually. I've seen them for six or seven pounds on Amazon. Uh, and the bottom bullet point is kind of cute too. Just do a search for QMU um, on the interwebs and, and you can actually emulate a Raspberry Pi environment on your PC. 
which I find thought about. It would be a great way to get screenshots, but I didn't do that. Um, so if you want to have a go on a PC, sounds a bit of a weird thing to do. It's possible. And that's the way that you would do it. So what's it good for? Why would I want a Raspberry Pi? Well, like I said, it's a computer. Um, it's not the most powerful one out there. And in terms of sitting at it, not too great. Makes a reasonable server. If you want to serve web pages out around your house or something, then it's good for that. If you want to share hard drives, if you've got a whole bunch of hard drives you want to push onto a, a network uh, uh, access storage facility, then you can bun that on there as well. Um, and like I said, if, if you um, blow it up, if you've got full admin rights, it doesn't really matter. Just get another SD card or rewrite it and off you go again. Uh, so you can use these things. People get quite good performance using them as web servers. So one guy has made a supercomputer by taking a whole bunch of pies and using Lego. Have you seen the Lego supercomputer? Yeah. Basically, he used Lego to put these things together. They made a big pile of them, um, which is quite interesting. They made a cluster. So you can get uh, reasonable amounts of power. I mean, 25 quid, it's, it's actually uh, not... That's what's that, a good night out, 25 quid? So one of these. I think I'd rather one of these. <laughs> there you go. Story of my life. So, media centre, here we go. Uh, I like this a lot. Um, I haven't got one at home because I've yet, at some point I'll take all my DVDs and put them onto hard drive and then I can actually dis dispense with the big uh, shelves around the house full of stuff. Um, and so you can then make a Pi into the client and uh, just just Google XBMC uh, and then find the image which does that and you can make it into a media center. Um, embedded devices, this is why I like it. I put Pies inside things uh, and uh, connect stuff to the pins uh, which I then control from software on the Pi and because it's connected I can then push that information into the cloud wherever I like and, and that works quite well. Um, you can even use it to run things like MAME on it and make it into an arcade cabinet uh, to the centre of which uh, I've also done and that also works rather well. So programming, that's what we're all here for right? If you get your Pi you can actually write pretty much every program language that you like, but by default you get a thing called Scratch, which is good if you've got youngsters around the place. Scratch is a good place to write silly little games, um, which you can actually publish onto the interwebs and folk can run inside their browser. But it's not a, pro it's not a proper language um, in that it has a graphical front end and you basically hang statements together by dragging and dropping, which is kind of cute, um, but at the end of the day, it's limited. I like the phrase non-threatening environment. It's kind of like a, a, a sweet place to work, and um, it's designed to get kids thinking about what programming is all about. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a fun way to pass an afternoon making some scratch games. Um, Python is uh, very big on the Pi. The Pi ships with a couple of Python implementations, um, and... Uh, it's a high level language which emphasis on readability yeah okay um, that means that um, um, yes you have to use indenting you have to lay it out properly for the program to work correctly and it's interactive which means it does all kinds of weird stuff you can't understand <laughs> at least for me Python everyone should learn some Python it's just hilarious um, Python's like building bridges with dynamite it's, it's great um, because if you make a tiny mistake the whole thing will explode there was a very famous programmer a few years ago said if programmers built sorry if people built bridges the same way programmers write code the first woodpecker that came along would destroy civilization completely that was the line you see and I reckon if you're writing Python a fairly large butterfly would do the job uh, quite successfully because Python is it's a great language to write and you can write code really quickly in Python and you can get yourself into trouble really quickly. So it's a bit like a Formula One race car, I guess, in that it takes you places really fast, but sometimes they aren't where you want to go. Um, learn it, though, because I can, I can generate code faster in Python than I can any other language, including C-sharp. Um, if it doesn't work, I, I, I also have more bother in Python than any other language because it's got nothing in the compiler to help me. But... Um, yes, if you want to impress people at interviews, say you do some Python. It's kind of like a nice thing to do. We're doing, one of our students is so keen on Python, he's offered to come and do a session on Python, which will be the first session in the new year. So when rather useful seminars start up in January uh, or February 2015, then we're going to do a session on Python first off. 
because by then people in the first year will know enough about programming to be able to appreciate the scary differences and the things that Python does that are so horrible. Uh, and, and then we can move on from there and try and go up. But do learn Python. It's hilarious. It's great fun. A Pi game. Pi game is Python's version of XNA, only more rubbish. Um, I'm not that keen on Pi game, but it does let you write games. Um, and uh, my solution really is, yeah, please use XNA. But if you're stuck in Python, you have to use that. It's kind of okay. Uh, Minecraft, yeah, I love that. And with the Python thing on top, it's fantastic. And the bottom one is the one I'm going to focus on for the next part of the talk, which is general purpose input output, which is basically connecting this thing to stuff and plugging it in and making things happen. In other words, talking to the hardware. Now, I love doing this um, because uh, it's surprising. You can show people programs that make stuff appear on the screen and they'll go, meh. Why does a program makes a light come on? And they'll go nuts. It's great. It's, it's quite, quite impressive. So what I'll do now is I'll basically go through how that works on, on the Pi. Um, and then you can think in terms of what you might like to plug your Raspberry Pi into, what you might want to do with it. So this is the this is the Pi um, pins. This is an old school Pi, so you've not got as many. The new Pis, the, the pluses, have about eight or so more pins on there, which you can control. Um, they're gathered into clumps, which I've got given names. Um, SPI stands for Serial Peripheral Interface, which sounds quite good. The Arduino's got one of these as well. If you buy a real-time clock chip, or an LCD panel, or an SD card reader, or a whole bunch of these things you can get from China for about five pounds, um, then it'll probably have an SPI connection. And so the way these things work, they have a clock, and then two data lines, uh, one for input, one for output, and uh, you can make them work by writing programs that twiddle the bits up and down, but it's much easier if the hardware's got this built in. So if you've got, when you use SPI, you've got basically the clock and the data signals there, and the chip enabled signals there for your serial peripheral interface. Otherwise, just use them as inputs or outputs. This thing's called a, you know what UART stands for? Really impress me. Wow. There you go. UART stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter. Not good. In other words, it's a serial port. Okay? So you've got serial it, transmit and receive. So I can plug that into devices that talk serial. Things like GPS devices talk serial port. So you can talk to them. And I squared C, lots of devices use that. That's inter integrated circuit connection. And that's basically. Um, I think your TV is full of I squared C. All the various bits and bobs inside there, the tuner and whatnot, are all controlled by the computer. And most of the time, they talk I squared C. I always even think about real-time clock chips, uh, serial memory devices, uh, A to D converters, and all kinds of fun and madness go on there. The rest of these guys, most of them are pins you can turn on or off in software control. And uh, so, yep, yeah, there you go. This is basically what I've just said. Um, and uh, yes, you've also got things called pulse width modulation outputs that you can use to drive motors uh, and make them go fast and slow, kind of sweet. Um, mild health warning, yeah. Um, you can blow your pie up by getting this wrong. You don't normally see bangs and smoke. It just never works again. Uh, sad face. Um, some, some people sell devices to protect your pie from deadly signals and the device costs about 25 quid, at which point I would go, well, what's the point of protecting a thing that costs 25 quid with a thing that costs 25 quid? But maybe I'm just an idiot, I've no idea. Um, I will say, I've never actually, two things. One is, I've not actually managed to blow anything up yet, and I don't worry too much about what I plug where. Second thing is that it's not gonna hurt you. Okay, you might blow the pie up, but you will survive the experience completely unscathed. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, as long as you're fairly careful, you'll be absolutely fine. So this is like a mild health warning. If you plug it in the mains, bad things will happen, obviously to your, your house and whatnot. But if you're careful and, and careful what you're doing, you'll be fine. If you want to, the kind of power you can get from these pins will light an LED and not do much else. But you can control relays with the pins. So you can turn on quite large devices should you wish to do that. And you can read inputs as well. If you want to read variable voltages, uh, as opposed to ons and offs, then extra hardware is required. There's a really astonishingly good value analog shield you can get to put on top of your Pi 
which gives you very high quality audio capture, among other things. It's actually quite sweet and well worth a look. Um, this is what I got. A book called SK Pang, who will sell you for about 15 quid uh, a nice Perspex case for your Pi, um, a breadboard, which has got places you can plug things in, and it also has a whole bunch of these jumper cables that you can use to link the pins on the Pi with the connections on the board. And what this is letting me do is I've got two inputs, two push buttons, and three outputs, red, green, and blue, which I'm going to use for traffic lights or whatnot. And it also comes with some resistors, these, these guys here, which can be used to reduce the amount of current flowing through the, the LEDs and not blow them up. Um, although I found that you don't actually need the resistors if you're feeling brave, it just tends to work. <laughs> but don't, don't quote me on that. So, not being recorded, never mind. So, um, I can write programs to turn these back on and off, and I can write programs to read these buttons. Um, is that okay with folks? Does that make sense? Everyone happy? Oh, that's good. So, in Python, let's have a look at some Python for giggles. Anyone know what sudo does? Sudo. Super user do. Yes, it means do this as God. Okay? Because, normally speaking, um, the operating system inside your Pi gets worried when you start writing programs to fiddle with the hardware. Because it is possible to... You can run programs that fiddle with the hardware and make the clock speed go strange and turn the video adapter off. Do all kinds of nasty virusy type things that wouldn't amuse the user very much. So generally speaking, the, the, the Pi uh, says you have to be super user to actually talk to the hardware. So what I do, I go, okay, okay, that's fine. Um, I'll do the Python command as a super user. So su su do sudo means do this with awesome power. So now my Python can talk to the hardware. If you've written C sharp, you'll know about bringing in libraries and, and using namespaces and stuff. Uh, Python has something very similar called import, and uh, I've got two things I'm importing. One is Raspberry Pi GPIO. GPIO stands for General Purpose Input Output, and that's the Python libraries that talk to the hardware. And time is the stuff that lets me do things like delays and whatnot. I absolutely love the statement import time. I think that's absolutely, I don't think Doctor Who would use I think it's really brilliant. So we bring in these two libraries, and now we can actually start making lights flash and, and doing things. Uh, so first thing I do is I say, OK, set the mode of the hardware so that when I talk about pin numbers, I'm talking about the numbers of the pins on this connector. Now this is a piece of weirdness which is caused by the way the Pi works. The Pi's got a chip on it made by a firm called Broadcom. It's a really good chip. It's a fantastic chip, in fact. It has what are notionally pins on it, which you can refer to by number. But I don't want to use the pins on the Broadcom chip. I want to use the pins on my connector. So I say, OK, number the pins according to the, the, the connector, and then set pin 11, which is one of the pins on here, um, to be an output. Okay, so I've done two lines. I've said, OK, um, let's number the pins in a way that makes sense to me. And let's use pin 11 as an output pin. And once I've done that, I can then just write true to it. And that makes it go high. And if I write false to it, it turns it off. Isn't that good? OK, right, please, please yourself. Tough audience, I don't mind. Here's a complete piece of Python. Um, at the top, we bring in the pins and the libraries. We bring in the time. We say it's a board, uh, which the pin number makes sense. Make pin 11 an output. And then while true, this is Python's loop that goes on forever. Um, set it to false, sleep for a second. Set it to true, sleep for a second, go around again. Uh, Python's layout means we don't need to put curly brackets around this because the fact it's indented means it'll be controlled by that while loop. This is kind of like Python's easy to understand design. Now, if you're used to C sharp, then it's a bit different. But there's nothing there which is particularly scary, correct? I'm kind of happy with that. So that this is what Python looks like. That colon is very important. That capital T in front of true is very important. If you don't put those in, really bad things will happen. And so, yep, I can do outputs. I can do inputs too. Um, if I say that pin 12 is the input, I can then, if the input is 12, 
then print its high. If it's not turned on, I'll get no message. So I can do simple input output very, very easily. Now, some pins in hardware terms can behave as what's called interrupts. They can actually cause code to run when they change state. We don't have that support in this library. We have to poll, we have to go and look. But that's fine because the process is fast enough to make things happen reasonably. So that's worth exploring. If you've got software that you want to write that controls things and also puts signals into the internet when stuff happens, then the Pi is really good for that. And one of the wonderful things about Python that makes it really exciting is there's a huge library of software out there which you can use with Python. So you can do things like you could make a web server running on here using Python, which will then let you go online and check the state of all your inputs from a web browser somewhere else. There's all kinds of wonderful libraries you can use to actually make that work. And so, yeah, explore that. Have fun. Go nuts. Arcade tables, yeah. I made that. I was playing Frogger. Uh, and uh, this is version 1. And we're stuck at version 1, although we're going to have to make a version 2 because the design of the joysticks and whatnot isn't quite as nice as I would like. What I have got here is an LG monitor, um, a table I bought from Argos, um, and I also went online to eBay and bought a set of joysticks and buttons, which I then carefully drilled holes and fitted to the, uh, the table to make into my console. Uh, is there a picture with the lid up? I don't know who's actually on this one. Um, I was of an age where you they used to have these things in pubs, arcade tables in pubs, and you could sit and play Pac-Man or whatnot or Defender uh, underneath your beer, as it were. I've always fancied having one of these, so um, I decided I'll build one using a Raspberry Pi. And uh, turns out it's a really good platform. It works very well. Um, it's cheap. It's small. The video output's very good, and it runs a thing called a Mame. Mame is multiple arcade emulator, or something along those lines. Um, you can get MAME for most platforms, including the PC, and it just pretends to be an arcade cabinet. There you go, multiple arcade machine emulator. Um, <coughs> turns out computers are really good at pretending to be other computers, and what MAME does is actually does that for you. So the MAME contains emulations of 6502s and 6809s and Z80s, which are all used inside of things, and it behaves like the hardware and the screen. And then you have like the ROMs, the physical chips that the games used to come in you can get images of these uh, on the interwebs in various places, plug them into your emulator and off you go and play the game. And it's running the same code as you were running about 20, 30 years ago in the arcades, which I find quite amusing. Uh, PyMame.org is a good place to find your Pi emulator and then away you go. Yeah, table from Ironbars, joystick and adapters from eBay, flat screen mic and speakers from Amazon, uh, I've got a wireless keyboard thing and uh, then I got my hub and whatnot from CPC. <coughs> That's the link to my blog which has got uh, all the bits and pieces I bought to actually make my arcade table um, and it mostly works. So that's pretty much a quick overview of the Pi. I was going to bring one in and show you it running but then I couldn't capture the video quite so well to capture the lecture so I, I didn't quite do that. But it's how many folk have got Pies? How many folk have played with them much? And the problem with the Pi is it, it's a bit like a slimming book or one of these fitness books that you buy. You think, oh, I'm going to get thin, I'm going to buy a book on slimming, and that will make me thin. And it doesn't, actually. It just goes on the shelf, along with all the other self-improvement things that didn't work either. And you think, I must have a pie, because I will learn about computers with a pie. And so you buy this thing, and it sits on your shelf for about six months, and then you think, you know, if I've got one of those tables from Argos, I could put it into an arcade machine. And so that's what I did. And I started thinking, you know, I bought this rather nice, slidey text display I got from Arachnid uh, computers which I've built I, I could make a scrolly text display with that and so it, it kind of winkles its way into your life as a sort of uh, a nice little sideline but it never really if, if you buy a pie and think I'm going to use that and change my life it probably won't happen like that but if you've got little side projects and things you fancy having a go at then the pie is really good for example you wouldn't well, you might do, but you'd be a bit crackers to dual boot your PC in Linux as well, um, I think, because it's just a lot of work and the big chunk of hard drive disappears. But get this, 
plug it into your telly and, and play with it. Why not? If you haven't got an uh, Apple TV device, we're thinking maybe you would like to stream video from a hard drive in your bedroom to the big screen telly in the front room. Uh, then a Pi is really good for that. So it'll just hang off the HDMI at the back and you can plug the USB thing in the USB socket on the back of your telly as well and off you go. So there's all kinds of nice things you can do with it. But as a sort of an end point, I'm not quite so convinced. There are some really nice books out there that cover how to use the Pi and projects. And the interfacing side is very interesting because you can basically plug it into anything you fancy. Uh, so that's kind of how I see the Pi fitting in. Anyone got any questions on that? Yeah? Yeah, so you said that how to output the data for, uh, to a net. How do you input data? To, to do what, sorry? Uh, output data. So you, you had the, the element that the left the number yeah. the element. Yeah, how do you input that data? You can, uh, you can make a pin, an input pin. And it will s if, if the pin's got three volts on it, it'll say it's high. If the pin's got naught volts on it, it'll say it's no. If the pin's got five volts on it, it says, oh my god, I'm on fire, and blows up. So you've got to be careful about your voltages. But if you look at, if I go back to this connector, doo -doo 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 -doo. so the question was, how do we get the inputs? And the answer is, I kind of show you here, because pin 12 is actually an input pin. But if you look at the, what you do, if I go back to my, come on, come on, come on, give me my number listing. Do, do, do one more, I think. No. No, oh, come on, there you go. This one here. If you look, you've got, got power rails, which you can use to actually drive the signals. And so you would effectively wire one of these power, power rails. There's your 3.3 one. That would be a good one to use. You run that as the output, and then you run it through a switch yeah. to the input, and you can detect when the input's pressed. Uh, and you can, there's extra bits of software you can add to buffer it and, and do whatever you want. In the case of me and my washing machine flooded the kitchen, it turns out if you just put two bits of wire about that far apart, if they get water between them, they do conduct. So you can put a transistor uh, on that. And what I did was I went to Maplin and they have this water alarm you can get for about a fiver, which normally drives a buzzer. Take the buzzer off and put the input to the Pi on that signal instead. Power it from the three volt. 3.3 volt output of the Pi so you don't blow anything up. And now I've got a thing which can detect when it's time to water the plants, which may or may not be interesting. But you could, for me, the thing I haven't done, which I should do, is I haven't really played with the camera, because the camera lets you capture video in close to real time as a sequence of JPEG images. And so I could do that kind of image processing stuff that I was doing with the Connect inside the embedded device, which is the Pi. And if you look online, there's some fantastic image processing algorithms you can get. You can download libraries, which will then let you find things in a scene and track them. So you can do all that kind of motion tracking stuff as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a fun side project toy. Um, and at the price, you, you can afford to buy one of these, uh, play with it for a while, get bored, and put it in a box on your shelf if you want. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a nice, it's a nice piece of kit to do that to do these kind of small projects with. That's been my experience. And that's how you do the inputs. I think you can get a, an AVI video stream as well through the Raspberry Vid command. Yeah. And you can, there's, a, there's a program you can get for your Pi that turns it into an FM radio transmitter. So you basically attach a piece of wire to one of these pins. And the Pi is sufficiently quick in terms of its processing speed to generate the wireless waveform that comes out of a radio. So you can effectively broadcast radio 2 from your Pi. Um, and, and you can, there's, there's enough grunt in the processor to actually generate the waveforms for the, for the actual uh, um, FM signal in software. Which I think is just, whoa, that's quite, that's quite scary, interesting. So you can, you can do that to broadcast some music and bits and pieces. Um, Does that mean you could receive FM as well? To receive FM, you need a tuned circuit to actually bring in the great aerial signal and make it into a level that will go in here. It's not quite the same. With, that, with output, it's easy because you just waggle the pin up and down fast enough to make it look like a, a radio wave. Input is a bit more tricky. Uh, in theory, you could, you could, there are people that will um, sell you programs that will turn your PC into a wireless receiver, but they all need a front end to do the tuned circuits bit. 
because you, you need that bit to receive. Any other questions? Well, we should get our hardware twiddling group off the ground. Maybe in the new year we'll do that. Maybe we'll have pies and Arduinos. Arduinos and pies go well together because the Pi is great for the connectivity side, not so good in terms of its connections in that you can't quite do hard real time to these, but the Arduino is great for that. The Arduino will talk to devices really quickly, and so you can actually get boards that go in here that have got Arduinos on them. Uh, the Arduino board will do that. And you plug that board, you've got the Arduino doing your inputs and your conditioning and sending messages to your Pi that then puts them on the web or whatever. Great fun to build. If you've got, if you're in second year looking for final year projects and whatnot, and you fancy doing one based on the Pi, then absolutely. Think in terms of going that way. It's actually kind of fun. Yes? 